Hello, this is Lisa from This Young Ian Life, and I wanted to let listeners know that this October 6th through 9th, I'm going to be running a women's fairy tale and yoga retreat in Pennsylvania's Pocono Mountains. The retreat will take place on the shores of a spring-fed lake, and we'll spend the days doing yoga and exploring key transitions in a woman's life using fairy tales. I'll be sharing some of the material from my upcoming book called The Return, A Homecoming for Women. There will be massage, hiking, and campfires. Oh, and beautiful fall foliage. This Jungian Life listeners can get a 5% discount by using the code this Union Life at checkout. That's This Union Life, all one word, capital T, capital J, capital L. To find out more or to register, go to my website, lisamarciano.com, and click on the tab called Wellspring Women's Retreat. I look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Union Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. Today we're going to talk about an ancient idea that still has relevance. We're going to talk about the daimon. This is something that Jung mentioned. Ancient Greek philosophers wrote about with great specificity and respect, and a concept that has continued forward, most often in religious contexts, but is something that creative types know about, talk about, and feel beholden to. Nietzsche wrote, I just don't seem to have a compass to tell me what I'm destined for, and yet, in looking back, everything seems to fit so well that it's as if a guiding spirit has been showing me the way. The idea of the guiding spirit an intelligence beyond the ego, which is invested in its creative ideals and requires the particular personality that it's linked to, to manifest that. And so we're going to talk about the idea of the creative spirit, the daimon, that drove Jung in his great prolific and creative process. I'm going to talk about how that still shows up in modern times. It does show up, of course, in modern times. And, of course, it's a very ancient idea. Uh, It's something that Socrates and Plato and Heraclitus and Hesiod, you know, all, all were concerned with defined and found a very meaningful concept as uh, a guiding spirit in Greek mythology uh, who was the provider and divider of fortunes or, or destinies. Hesiod, who chronicled many of the Greek myths, uh, felt that uh, there had been people of an original ancient prehistory <laughs> golden age uh, who had uh, been transformed into daimons by Zeus, and they would serve mortals benevolently. Uh, so they're intermediaries for a lot of people. And today we think of them more as inborn uh, passions, talents, and proclivities for following a certain path in life. The Jungian analyst James Hillman wrote The Soul's Code in 1996. It was a best-selling book. It's still a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. And the whole book kind of takes as its premise this matter of the daimon. And so Hillman spends a little time defining it right in the beginning. And I just want to read a paragraph. He says, each person enters the world called 
The idea comes from Plato, his myth of Ur at the end of his most well-known work, The Republic. I can put the idea in a nutshell. The soul of each of us is given a unique daimon before we are born, and it has selected an image or pattern that we live on earth. This soul companion, the daimon, guides us here. In the process of arrival, however, we forget all that took place and believe we come empty into this world. The daimon remembers what is in your image and belongs to your pattern and therefore, your daimon is the carrier of your destiny. I find that description interesting. It it creates a certain kind of tension in my understanding, which I'm enjoying. That, <laughs> <laughs> is that Hillman is creating a notion, creating an image in our imagination of something that knows us better than the ego knows itself. Mm-hmm that is holding something that is an extension of what we should be. I feel like in the more ancient literature, it feels more like the daimon has its own agenda that is imposed upon the ego or the individual. One might argue that what the ego creates is lasting and substantive and amazing. But the feeling is that the ego is as mystified as anyone else about where this has come from and seems vulnerable to the insistence of the daimon to bring it forward. I mean, as I'm saying that I can understand how they overlap, one seems more differentiating, one seems more psychological just kind of holding that creates a different feeling for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it, it rem the Hillman quote reminds me very much of the Nietzsche quote that you read. Mm -hmm. There's this sense that we don't know, we've, for we've forgotten something. And, and the way, you know, sometimes when you forget something, somehow the shadow of it is still in your consciousness. So there's this sense that we can maybe have an inkling of our destiny but we also feel it pressing forward because I do believe, Joseph, just like you said, I mean, and, you know, I, I love this idea of the diamond because it's such a beautiful, colorful image to describe something that I think most, if not all of us feel in one way or another, that there is some part of us that is pressing us in a certain direction that seems to have its own will, like you said. And sometimes it is uncomfortable, it may be embarrassing, it may be preposterous, but there's something that makes an inner demand. I'm wanting to uh, bring this down a little bit more into a realm we're more familiar with, or at least I, I think we all are. And that's what Jung says, which is um, these mythic languages such as mana, daimon, and God, are synonyms for the unconscious. And I kind of like that, and that the task is, yes, there is a part of us that is pressing for individuation, that is pressing us uh, to find a calling and stay true to our innermost nature and how it wants to grow. And we have to come to terms with that consciously. Otherwise, it may just toss and turn us about and have its way with us. And we can just say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's not me. It's my daimon. It's my calling. It's my whatever it is. Uh, so it comes down to how do we relate to it? Otherwise, it can possess us. And our task is to possess it or to uh, bring it into consciousness. I don't think we can possess it. I don't think we can possess it. I, I, th I think that one of the brilliant things about this concept is it does make whatever this is. And, you know, the Romans called it a genius. Mm -hmm. That was the Roman word for, for daimon. It's not our ego that's doing this or making it happen. It's some other part of us that isn't quite human that we can have a relationship with 
But in a way, thinking of it that way helps us keep our feet on the ground. Yes. When I use the word possess, I agree with you completely. It is not within ego control, but we are charged with the responsibility to have a conscious relationship with it, lest it whip us around and lead us into excesses. And we we can think of a ton of celebrities who were obviously very gifted, but who, it might be safe to say, did not come into this kind of relationship with their daimon. And this goes to something that von Franz wrote about, that if there is something creative inside of you that you do not bring forward, it will turn into a kind of poison, which I think is also inferred in one of the Gnostic texts as yeah, well. I think, I think it's, in, it's the Gospel of Thomas. Yeah. So that speaks to what you were um, saying, Deb, that there is, for people who have a very strong creative diamond, which not everyone does, that if we do not meet the demand, that a kind of tension builds up in the psyche and the nervous system, which can make us unwell. Here's another Nietzsche quote relative to that. Illness is the answer every time we begin to doubt our right to our task. Every time we begin to make things easier for ourselves, strange, and at the same time, terrible. So there is this feeling that when we are congruent with this inner voice, things are more positive, although it comes as at a cost. I mean, there's a way in which Jung lamented feeling driven. Yes. As many people do. I mean, yes. This there seemed to be no rest mm-hmm. for, for him and many other creative folks and seemed to just gobble up so much of the internal real estate such that the inner daimon didn't seem to let him take an interest even in other things and even in other homey things like his family life, mm-hmm. apparently, mm-hmm. and other kinds of reasonable cultural tasks. The daimon just grabbed him and cordoned off what he was going to do with this life. And it did come at a cost and, of course, a great benefit for all of us. So we're really in the territory here um, that you alluded to earlier, Joseph, of holding the tension of the opposites, that we uh, need to struggle with our daimon, uh, particularly if it's a very, very powerful one. Uh, It's not as if this is easy of just sort of sitting down at the table and over a cup of coffee and having a conversation, that these urges can be incredibly intense. And we have to wrestle with the angel like, like Joseph did in the Old Testament. And he came away from that with a dislocated hip. But that's, that's the job. You, you know, I, I want to say, though, I think, Joseph, you've already alluded to this, that our diamonds are very individual and unique. And we all have one, but the quality of our individual diamonds will will really differ. So, you know, Aristotle said, happiness is to live in harmony with one's diamond. And that Gospel of Thomas quote, just so we have it on the table here, is if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. So there is this necessity of answering the demands of the daimon. For some of us, that might look very tempestuous, uh, as for some of the celebrities that we've referenced, or, or even Jung. But for others of us, it, it may actually feel relatively harmonious to be in right relationship with the daimon, to make space to become what the daimon is requiring us to become. I want to share a little um, vignette from my practice. I'm working with a a young woman who's becoming prominent. She's becoming a a bit of a public figure. And for her, you know, this is this is difficult. And so we've been talking about it. And I was asking her about uh, her kind of early relationship with any desire to be somewhat renowned. And she said, oh, yeah, I always thought like that I would be famous in some way. 
And she said, my favorite TV show when I was a kid was Hannah Montana, which is the story of, I think she's, I've never seen it actually, but I think Hannah Montana is a, a super pop star who goes to high school and is kind of a, a nerdy girl that no one likes, but she has this sort of secret life as a superstar. And uh, my client and I were talking about how this television show sort of mirrored this dual reality that she was living with, that she was struggling socially, she was struggling academically, she wasn't popular, she wasn't a great student, she felt ugly and awkward. But inside, her daimon knew that she was destined for some other trajectory, a little bit like Hannah Montana. And in fact, she's beginning to live that out. And, and uh, it's not without its trials and tribulations, but it certainly feels more right than when she wasn't living it out. This also reminds me of the way prodigies of all kinds often speak. I've recently been reading a book that um, Deb, you'd recommended a long time ago, Far From the Tree. Mm. by S Solomon, I think is the last mm -hmm. name of the author. Mm -hmm. yes. And he has a wonderful chapter on prodigies. And what's clear often to these extraordinary young people and their parents is that something that is unprecedented, that the child could never have been exposed to, has manifested in the child's psyche that you have a little four-year-old kid and they give them a violin to play around with. And, you know, within 24 hours, they figured out how to play a song and play it well. That these extraordinary capacities, which claim and demand the attention and the life force of the child, are forces of nature that are dangerous to be thwarted. And many prodigies when they have been deprived of their instrument or their opportunity to express their gift, fall into overwhelming despair and inconsolable despair. So it speaks to the way that the creative image can possess a child and bring them to an enormous amount of excellence and still also make them not always well adapted to the outer world. And I think we have evidence that Jung struggled with that as well. Absolutely. At the end of his life, he reflects on that. Uh, and he says, I've had much trouble getting along with my ideas. There was a diamond in me, and in the end, its presence proved decisive. It overpowered me. And if at times I was ruthless, it was because I was in the grip of the diamond. I could never stop at anything once attained. I had to hasten on to catch up with my vision. Since my contemporaries, understandably, could not perceive my vision, they saw only a fool rushing ahead. I doubt that very much. But uh, he talks about, I had to obey an inner law which was imposed on me and left me no freedom of choice. Of course, I did not always obey it. How can anyone live without inconsistency? And then he talks about relationships with people and how those relationships were governed and determined by ideas that they shared, you know, ra rather than just a personal enjoyment and connection. It really points up how difficult it can be when there is a very powerful creative spirit boiling in one, uh, mm -hmm. that one and how hard it is to learn to serve it and and relate to it uh it's a it can be a hard life managing such creative energy yeah i mean can you imagine young sitting around and like making small talk about i don't know <laughs> the neighbor's tomatoes you know inside his like brain is going a million miles an hour about you know alchemy or something and Jung did, of course, achieve an incredible relationship with his diamond. He was astonishingly productive. And in my view, he basically mapped the unconscious for all of us. But uh, we could all think of examples of diametric opposites. And uh, Hillman, in his 
book that we've already referenced, The Soul's Code, uses the example of Judy Garland, who came from a showbiz family, and when she was two years old or two and a half, she sang Jingle Bells solo on stage, and the audience loved it, and she knew she wanted to do that. And she said, can I do that, Daddy? Uh, she knew exactly what she wanted to do. And then uh, as an adult, with all her difficulties, mental health and marriages and addictions and so on, uh, she reflected and said, all my life, I've done everything to excess. If we have a powerful daimon, it's not necessarily um, an enviable road uh, to be on. And I do think that it possibly... I'm, I'm sort of working out a theory here, but it seems to me like sometimes extraordinarily talented people. So, you know, Judy Garland just had this incredible set of chords, right? I mean, that's just mm -hmm. a physiological trait. Yes. But there was also this inner psychological trait, this daimon that pressed her forward to, to use them. I mean, I mean, I suppose you, there could be a million Judy Garlands out there with just gorgeous, a gorgeous voice who don't feel this inner pressure to live out that talent. But I suspect the two things often go together. I'm curious as to how that diamond, which we can see so sharply and dramatically in the people we've just highlighted, but how does that live in most of us? The, the thing I would say is based on even what Jung said, is I'm not sure that everybody has a necessarily significant daimon. And just to be bold about it, that when these various creative types are talking about the demands of the creative spirit, it seems to be these are rather extraordinary types, creative types, and extraordinary demands. Now, it may very well be that all of us are assigned or manifest a kind of internal support, a kind of guiding spirit. But many of those things seem interested in, in a very homely, conventional life, if we can even say there's a daimon involved. So I'm curious, Deb, how do you imagine everyone having a daimon? Well, I relate it uh, very much to the process of individuation. That is, at least within our reach possibility, perhaps we can even just imagine it, of what does it mean to be whole, to be in connection and relationship with our own personal unconscious, and then that deeper sense of a guiding spirit that Jung referred to as the self. And, and surely we, we all have that. And uh, we may live out our lives as many, many a person has done for the sake of our family. Of, of, there was a wonderful essay in, in yesterday's Times uh, by a man, a black man whose father had, had worked hard and supported his family, and been wise beyond his years. Uh, and that was his daimon, was to live a life of daily courage, devotion, and consciousness uh, in the Jim Crow South. And now uh, one of his children is writing a column for a major U.S. newspaper. So I would say we all have a daimon. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if, if you think about a, the daimon as a personal sense of destiny or a particular talent that one needs to realize, one can have a talent for making delicious meals for your family. One can have a, a talent for friendship, a talent for happiness. It's about, I think, responding to the call that is within you and and some calls are more modest by, I guess, collective standards. That that will send me off on uh, one of my rants. So so here it goes. 
It's wonderful to think of people uh, who have an amazing artistic, creative talent of some kind. If I have understood Jung and just uh, many another um, age-old value system correctly, it, it really is our task uh, to become whole and to live in service to our deepest self, you know, and to the world and the life we're given. And so it's very tempting to uh, point to these great stars who are, you know, in the public eye all the time versus the preschool teacher who has influenced the lives of hundreds and hundreds of children over the years in service to her diamond or his diamond in a profession that, you know, will not ever attract any public notice. And that life is just as important, just as meaningful, just as real, just as whole as someone who's in the public eye. And no one would doubt that. I think that's kind of humanitarian respect is reasonable and and something that um, we've all embraced as social workers before we were analysts as well. And yet, can we tolerate that there is also a spectrum of manifest talents that even though all people deserve to be loved and honored and all people make a contribution, can we really say that Albert Einstein and most of us are comparable? Yes, we're mucking about doing the best we can, but Einstein was aligning with his daimon to penetrate the mathematical secrets of the universe. So, uh, yes, Joseph, I think what I would say in response to that is that I believe, personally, that we all have a daimon, but as I said earlier, the quality of one one person's daimon might be very different from another. And, and some people are, do have a daimon that uh, propels them on toward a more illustrious destiny, shall we say? Mm-hmm. I, I think your example, though, raises a different issue, which is sometimes for one reason or another, we're not able to be in alignment with our daimon. And that might be because we refuse to listen to it, because it demands too much from us, because it's too harsh of a taskmaster, because it drives us forward into things that are self-destructive even. I mean, the diamond can be, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not all positive. But we can also be uh, tragically kept from living in alignment with our diamond by outer circumstances and poverty, lack of education, disruptive traumas, war can, can all be part of that which keeps us from being in harmony with our daimon or makes it more difficult or, or holds us back in some way. Although it seems unfriendly to put cultural contributions in a kind of rating process. Yeah, obviously that there's, there's and a reality yeah, there. Yes. You know, I am moved to say that 19th century mysticism, particularly in the Western world, brought forward this idea about achieving the knowledge and conversation of one's holy guardian angel, which is a more conventional religious way that the higher genius, the daimon, uh, kind of moved into Catholicism. And that some of these organizations claim to have methods to attain this knowledge and conversation. So, Shifting my position a little bit, I think the presupposition is that we do have this access, but that some people's personalities may have to undergo a substantial transformative process, a kind of salve et coagula many times before the instrument of the personality can have knowledge and interactive access to this creative spirit. And some of us 
as you said, maybe based on genetics or circumstances or the shape of our personality, find that very easy to do. As we said with prodigies, you know, by three years old, some kids are already have this consciousness of a, you know, a 30 year old, you know, when they're being put into kindergarten, you know, when they're reading already at like a 10th grade level. For reasons that are mysterious, some of us do seem to have a vehicle that acts more expressively for the daimon, and some of us have to hammer something into place if we are called to it and if we find our way to that. And I wonder if, in a certain sense, coming back to something you had said, Deb, that this may be what Jung was leaning in to when he was talking about the individuation process as a process that while everyone has access to, people need to work at and have to submit to a transformational process, which often is compared to a crucifixion process in order for the ego to get into a state that is receptive enough to these inner forces. Yeah, I mean, it seems, it seems like we could talk about a couple of different categories of how things could go wrong with the daimon. So I feel like we've talked about a couple of different categories of times when we're not in right relationship with the daimon. And, and just to organize this a bit, we can be possessed by the daimon. It can uh, absolutely have us in, our, in its grips. And as Jung was talking about, sometimes make life very inconvenient. Or in the case of someone like Garland, who lived this self-destructive life, it can actually kind of ruin you. I mean, think of all these kind of celebrity suicides. I think many of them, we could think about those as someone in the grip of the daimon. We can have a problem when we resist the commands of the daimon. You know, if, if you're a creative type and you're not, you're not sitting down every day at your desk to write or practice music or whatever, and then you find that you have a sort of mysterious accident, you wind up breaking your leg, and then you just have to sit there. You know, <laughs> one way to, to wonder about that is, oh, the, the daimon was like, hey, you're not doing what you need to do. I'm going to make sure you do it. And, and a lot of creative people have those kinds of experiences. And then the final way is the one that I mentioned before, where, you know, we, we have something that, that is making an inner demand on us, and it's very difficult for us to address that because of outer life circumstances. So, so these are all ways that, that we can wrestle with this or, or struggle with it. It seems to me that maybe the essence of this when the daimon is one of those incredibly powerful, demanding inner forces, is transforming it uh, from this sort of uncontrolled energy, almost like an ar a force of nature, into something where, where ego has some authority, and ego has some control, and ego has some its own way to uh, be uh, to have a commanding presence. I'm going to the um, you know the famous story of of Jacob wrestling with the angel, and he was there alone at night, and and he says uh, the the passage says a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not, did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. And Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And then he asks for the angel's name, and it's not given. But I think that that passage, unless you bless me, which the angel does, it is a wonderful way of imaging uh, the relationship between the daimon and the ego. And that at some point, the ego does have the power to command, you will speak to me, you will befriend me, you will be in my service too. Uh, yeah. and it really does speak to the power of of consciousness, which of course is... Uh, something that Jung said over and over again, that it's not that the unconscious is greater than, more than, 
consciousness has its say. And Jung said, you know, it's the old story of the hammer and the anvil between conscious and unconscious or ego and daimon. Deb, what, what that story makes me think of is the fairy tale of Rumpelstiltskin. Ha. Ah. And in, in according to my reading of the tale. I the love this leap from, <laughs> from, from Genesis to Rumpelstiltskin. Well, but they're both mythological stories. They're Absolutely. both archetypal stories. Yep. Uh, the, the, the Miller's daughter is actually quite talented. She's been wounded in her creativity because she has a she has a father wound. She has a narcissistic father, and I know that because he goes around town, kind of trading on his daughter's talents, l- lying about her, ostensibly bragging, saying my daughter can spin straw into gold, to the king, and that lands her in a heap of hot water because then she's in the in the basement of the castle with a room full of straw, being told that if she doesn't spin it into gold before daybreak, she will be put to death. So she she cries and this funny little man appears and says, you know, what will you give me if I spin this straw into gold? And she gives him a ring, which I, which is so funny, right? Because this little man can literally spin straw into gold, but he'll take payment of a ring. I mean, it's so it's so great <laughs> how it doesn't make any sense. But but anyway, I, I see the little man as her daimon, her creativity, which she experiences as demonic because she's been uh, prevented from having right relationship with it due to the father wound. And therefore it, it is menacing when she runs out of things to give him on the third night, she promises him her firstborn child. She doesn't have any other choice. So she's happily wed to uh, this, this um, terrible King who was willing to put her to death but she does eventually have a, a son and then Rumpelstiltskin comes back and says, I want, you know, give me the baby. And much like in the biblical story, in order to prevent that from happening, she, she has to come up with his name. Mm. The, the naming is something about having power over. Yeah. And of course she does, at which point in the fairy tale, he disappears, which, you know, we can think of that she got rid of him. But really, I think what happened was she integrated it. And and now she had kind of full command in my imagination of her creative faculties of her. She was now in right relationship with her diamond. She could live in harmony with her diamond, which was actually, there's a word for that. It's, it's eudaimonia, to live in harmony with your diamond. When we have a name for something, uh, then it's in consciousness. We have managed the difficult task of lifting a vague feeling and emotion and intuition uh, into consciousness and containing it in a name, uh, which Jacob did not get from the angel, but our uh, fairy tale heroine did get in knowing that his name was Rumpelstiltskin. I think that that ancient wisdom about gaining the name of something goes all the way back to Egyptian mythology and Egyptian magic influenced all kinds of things that flowed into Western Europe. But that's always been a really fascinating, fascinating idea about the name. And that often the name and the thing were thought to be one, which is something that we see in Judaism, that the name of God and God in the beginning was the word and the word was God. So the word, the name, and the thing that it connotes have an inseparable reality. You know, I I want to take us over to talking about the relationship between a daimon and a complex, uh, which is another way of talking about the relationship between consciousness and the unconscious. And how do we go about the process of discerning that this person's urge to, uh, let's say, hitchhike across the United States and back, uh, is the daimon calling that person to discover and become versus uh, something that is really not in service of growth and development? 
there, there's a, we haven't talked about how do you tell the difference? This one criteria that I was taught in the beginning of my own training around uh, Kabbalah and mysticism is that as we develop our interiority in, through one method or another, that we will begin to receive internal impressions. Often those impressions can show up as auditory. One theory is that the auditory center of the brain is in some ways the most sensitive to the inner world. When we begin to receive these impressions, we'll often need to distinguish between the voice, which is the idea of the voice of this guiding genius, versus the voices, the multiplicity of voices, which I think are connected to the complexes. And the difference, which I have had some experience of, is that the daimon does not simply communicate. When it communicates, it lifts the consciousness temporarily so that the individual knows why that is being communicated, knows the context of the application, and in that moment feels that what's been revealed makes perfect sense and in such a way that they can explain it to other people. Mm. When the voices come in, which I think are the voices of the complex, people may still receive impressions, auditory or not, of something that stimulates them. Let's say an image of Las Vegas. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of energy around it. And there's this feeling like, gosh, I don't know why I'm thinking about Las Vegas, but I guess maybe I should go there. But that little twist of, I'm not sure why I'm doing this, suggests that there hasn't been an illumination of consciousness. There's been just the bestowing of an impulse. And I think we should be very cautious and suspicious of the many voices and the simply charged images that seem to be kicking our butt in a direction but we can't really explain that to ourselves or to other people. To me, that's a differentiation that seems meaningful. I also think about the way the diamond works in a life as having a long arc. So I was talking before about uh, the, the woman who liked Hannah Montana when, when she was a child. Oftentimes you can see the work of the diamond throughout your life, if you look for it, it's like a through line. And I mean, for myself, you know, I can remember being very, very young and just, I want to say kind of knowing that I would write a book one day, but in some sense it, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have a sense of ease around that. It was like, you know, eventually it was sort of a, you know, a longing like, oh, if only, or I'd love to. But as a very young kid, I, I just I just remember just kind of writing books in my head all the time, even even when I was like five or six, you know, I would sort of and, and, and sort of never went away entirely, even when I was doing other things or pursuing other careers or I put it down for for years and years and didn't even think about it really consciously much. Probably it wasn't an impulse that came upon me, uh, you know, when I was. 50 or something. It, it's been with me my whole life. And I think that often the daimon has that kind of feel to it that you can recognize that, yeah, there was that, there was that, there was this other time. And, and somehow this has always been nagging at me. This has been uh, nipping at my heels. Daimon is nag. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really liking so much what you've both just said as uh, a way to determine the difference between the call of the daimon and an impulse or an urge. That the daimon has a long arc. We make a commitment to it, which takes us into Jung's uh, ethical stance of, are you really willing to stand on this space? And put in the time, maybe uh, to go to school, to learn a new task, to uh, undergo uh, the difficulty of making a major life transition, changing careers, for example. Or in your case, Lisa, a 10-year process of daring to write this book 
and go through all the steps necessary to find a publisher and bring it into the world. That is a long arc of of just working it, uh, to put it colloquially. Yeah, and you know, relevant to this discussion, I'll say that there were times when I would sort of literally just stop and ask myself, does this still have energy for me? Because, you know, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty daunting, the whole like finding a publisher part. So I would sort of check in with myself, I would sort of like go quiet, go in and be like, yeah, okay, do I really, do I really need to do this? I mean, I, I, I've got plenty of other things to do. But the answer would just rise up. Yes. And that's Joseph's point exactly about hearing a voice, mm-hmm. one voice consistently there, which is very different from the example you gave, Joseph, of, I think I'll go to Las Vegas. Although it's interesting because I can also think of times in my life when I had a crazy impulse and I, I didn't have that. Illu- I, I know what you're talking about, about the illumination. <laughs> I've had that. But there have been other times when I had a crazy impulse and I didn't have the illumination <laughs> and I did it and it was probably the right thing to do in hindsight. So I don't, it's not, there's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to know. Sure. And I also think that the voices of the complexes are not all destructive. Mm-hmm. Like the, the inner trickster in me that's like, let's go to Vegas. And then I go to Vegas and it was a really great time and I feel refreshed and I made some friends and I could say that was really positive. And for me, probably still wasn't coming from that creative genius, but it was lovely and nothing bad happened. You know, you, you know I think I want to um, put in a plug, as it were, for working this from the other side, uh, maybe from the outside in. Because, you know, I don't, I cannot lay claim to having had uh, one of these experiences of some, you know, inner calling that existed in me from childhood. I think it's also possible to have an idea, to consider it as a real question that consciousness can't answer, and then try it. And I remember going to college, and I was filled, filled with self-doubt. And yet I, you know, I've obviously filled out all the application points, and there were a number of high school teachers that helped me get in. And then I would say, well, I'm here, and I'll try it. I'll, I'll just do what I can do. And very much the same thing with analysis and analytic training and being in a seminar I didn't know, so I tried it. And I think that can also be a path lest we be uh, promulgating, um, you know, sort of enlightenment descending like the dove from above as being the only way. It's not the only way. You know, as a, a supervisor when I was a nursery school teacher once said to the kids, put a smile on your face, it'll work its way in. And I think we can live into it as well as have being inspired. So, Deb, I'm thinking about this tension between the extraordinary daimonic experience and then the more humble, reasonable experience of this inner guidance that perhaps most people have. And I am thinking about a 60 Minutes interview with Bob Dylan. This happened, I think, in 2004. And Bob Dylan was explaining that he owed his success to a kind of deal that he made inside of himself. The interviewer asks, why are you still out here? And Dylan says, it goes back to that destiny thing. I made a bargain with it, you know, long time ago, and I'm holding up my end. What was your bargain? To get where I am now. (laughs) Should I ask who you made the bargain with? With the chief commander. On this earth, in this earth, and in the world we can't see. That's really, that's really wonderful. Uh, That something wants wanted to come into the world through him. And uh, he made a deal. We can all do that. Something wants to come into the world through all of us. And just as you were saying, Deb, that you know, there's a role that the ego ideally needs to say yes in order to have 
a kind of companionship with the daimon and a reciprocity. Not that Bob Dylan didn't have to work his tail off to get the skills and put up with all kinds of turbulence to get it and all kinds of difficulty keeping on track as his career was moving forward. And yet, when we feel like we have that internal companion, that internal support, it can give us a kind of wellspring of energy to persevere. Maybe that's the time to switch to a dream. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. During Dream School's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. Our dreamer is a 39-year-old male who works as a psychologist, and here's his dream. I am sitting in the front row of an academic lecture in a large auditorium. I can see my father sitting way back in the last row. A speaker is introduced. He begins to perform miraculous feats. For example, although he is an older man in his 60s, he successfully bench presses over 500 pounds on stage. Next, he begins to levitate. While flying through the air, he proclaims that he is Jesus. He demands that everyone in the audience pray to him in worship. I do not pray to him. He goes around to each audience member and requests a prayer. All obey. When he appears in front of me, he demands a prayer. I hold up two sticks in the shape of a cross and denounce him. I state angrily that Christ protects me and that this old man is not God. At this point, I notice that my father in the back row is the only other person in the building not praying to the fraud. As context, he adds, the dream was approximately the two-year anniversary of losing my business. At this time, I was still trying to rebuild myself professionally after this loss. The main feelings are fear and anger, followed by love once I saw my father not praying. This is a, this is a really, really interesting dream. One of the things that comes up referentially is Jung's idea of the manna personality. And that some people seem to be configured, according to Jung, to have a relationship to the collective unconscious in such a way that they have a mediumistic channel to what's emerging and are able to give voice to that in a way that other people feel compelled and compelled to align, to affirm. And such manner of personalities can develop a tremendous amount of status. Frightening example of that was Adolf Hitler, which of course is a grotesque, frightening image. But in much lesser ways, there are all kinds of modern charismatics that one has to question, why is that person so compelling? Or why is what they're saying seem to have so much influence on most people. So I don't know whether the dream is about his own capacity for this mana personality dynamic, or whether it's a commentary on other forces or people that are around him, because we didn't have a lot of context that was given. And, and just in 
going back to dream theory, most analysts feel that the dream is commenting on something that was stirred up in the last one to three days prior to the dream, that the psyche is working something out. So lacking that really immediate context, I'm left in a more conceptual realm. Yes, I, I agree with you, Joseph, that we we don't have a lot of context to ground this. I, I think you're on to something there with the man of personality, and I would just build on that by saying that it also seems to have something to do with masculinity and obviously the father. So all of the important characters in this dream are male, that we're missing any feminine uh, characters. And the man on stage is is performing these feats, at least the first one of bench pressing. I mean, this is this is generally associated with and bench pressing is generally something that men do. Of course, there are there are women bodybuilders as well. But that that is uh, building up that that kind of strength is is an area that we might typically associate with the masculine. And, and so there's something about this tremendous masculine capacity that is, uh, you know, really extraordinary. I mean, he starts to levitate. And I agree with you. I wonder, does, does this speaking about uh, maybe something that's in the father complex? Uh, or is it is it an aspect of his own psyche, the capacity to become, let's say, inflated? Perhaps he's very potent, but also can become somewhat inflated. We don't know how he lost his business. But in any case, he seems to 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 take the right attitude toward it at the end. Would would you would you all agree with that? Yes, and I thought too about how this dream is very much in the realm of the masculine. There's our dream ego who is a uh, male, the father, the speaker, and then the invocation of of Jesus of Christ. And then the the speaker is the pretender the inflated image. What I'm wondering about is where and how this drama lives in our dreamer. And I, I've really been kind of sitting with that because Jung is very clear that every part of the dream, in almost all cases, is part of the dreamer. The the playwright, the director, the prompter, and and the cast of characters. And I'm putting that in the context of uh, the reference to having lost his business. And here in this dream, uh, both the dream ego and the father uh, are able to, to summon a countervailing opposition here uh, to the speaker who can levitate and declares himself, uh, basically he declares himself God. So I, I am, like you, wondering about the father principle uh, and the dream ego being able to resist the inflated uh, spirit of pretend greatness. It does feel like the father is a kind of bulwark against the inflation which seems to be perhaps coming from somewhere else in his psyche. I also want to just mention that the setting is in an academic lecture hall. Mm -hmm. And so I'm also wondering if there's some relationship to the inflation one might feel as, let's say, a professor, in as much as, you know, you're sitting there lecturing to 200 or 400 kids in a, in a lecture hall and there's an enormous amount of esteem uh, that is uh, provided around that, which can be inflating, of course, to any of us. But also, there are superhuman demands that are being made at professors right now. A lot of professors, mm -hmm. some of whom are my friends, could easily say, my God, it's as if they want me to levitate and bench 500 pounds, and then I've got to you know, do this and do this and do this. And I'm working 70 hours a week and for in, inadequate pay. So there's also that ambivalence around having to identify with this superhuman image in order to survive. And, mm -hmm. and I think Lisa, you've mentioned this before that at certain moments in the heroic journey, 
the inflation gets you through it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if this is the bivalence of the inflation. There's a way in which it could serve somebody to get through something, but then it comes at a cost. Yeah. There's also the image here of our dream ego in the front row and the father sitting in the back row. So sort of book ending what goes on in the middle, so to speak. Uh, but I think I'm going to channel you for a minute, Lisa, and uh, reference how this dream reminds me of the fairy tale of the fisherman and his wife, uh, where the fisherman goes down and catches a fish that can talk, and the fish says, you know, please let me go, and maybe I can help you out. And he goes home and uh, basically says to his wife, you know, guess what happened to me today? I met a fish who could talk and the wife says, oh, my God, you know, go back down there and, and ask him to, um, you know, give us a nice little cottage instead of this miserable little hovel. And he does. And the fish grants the wish. And the wife is never satisfied. So her demands increase and increase and they wind up, she be winds up being queen and then she winds up being Pope. But when she asks to be God, the bubble bursts and they go back to where they started from. I'm wondering about uh, how that kind of story is played out that the speaker begins to perform miraculous feats Although he's an older man, he successfully bench presses 500 pounds on stage. Wow. Then he begins to levitate. Oh, my gosh. But when he says he's Jesus, that's when the other uh, players in this dream drama c come into being. The dream ego says no, and the dream ego's father says no. Yeah, that's uh, that's really a helpful amplification. I, I, I'm finding the question that's coming up that I think builds on that, Deb, is, is this question, to what are we in service? Mm -hmm. And everyone else in the auditorium is willing to pray to this fraud. And, and so where in our lives are we in service to, to something that is, is fraudulent? or uh, is pretending to be something that it's not. And then to be in service to, to say, Christ protects me, part of the sort of Christian ethos is uh, there is the sense of kind of being humble before God. And, and so I think that uh, kind of stating your allegiance to, to Christ in that sense is something about the appropriate relativization of the ego. I do want to say, just apropos of, of not much, I'm super curious about the uh, dreamer's relationship with his father because I hear the love and I hear that the father is this really positive figure in the dream. And yet I'm also curious because just the statement, this old man is not God. Is that a statement about his father? And and is is this about also... The, the separation that we have to make from our parents where, where we kind of stop seeing them as gods. But I think that makes perfect sense that the benign father and the inflated father are two sides of the father complex at the very least. If I step way back and think about it in a purely archetypal way, there's a process that we all go through often in midlife, but not only then, where the religion of our childhood collapses in the face of our adult psychology and our adult needs. And for many of us, I mean, I was raised in the Catholic Church. My image of God was of an, a levitating old man, although sometimes it was about a lamb, which always really confused me. The Lamb of God and God, and all those images were very hard for me to resolve, you know, when I was six. That said, the idea of the paranormal old man isn't adequate. It isn't philosophic enough. It isn't something that an adult psyche can find meaningful enough to stay in relationship to the religious idea. And so it may very well be here at 39, easily a place where midlife crisis is beginning to happen, that 
There is a rebuking of the old religious beliefs, ideas, and values, and perhaps making way for the emergence of a more appropriate God image. And Jung writes about this beautifully and very fully in um, his volume called Ion, where he just tracks the evolution of the God images historically, but through that, helping us understand that as the human psyche evolves its capacity to imagine the divine also evolves and can present something that is more meaningful and more relevant and more useful as a symbol in as much as symbols help us connect to things in the collective unconscious. And so again, the demanding, paranormally strong, levitating old man you know, could sound a little bit like Yahweh or Yahweh in the child's conception of it. And there's an opportunity here to challenge that and rebuke it, which is a way of demanding something better. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.